you were here yesterday, thank you for your help, thank you for all your effort, and thank you for the store backs that I'm sure you have today, because I know I have one, and uh, it was awesome. We still have a little bit more to do. If you want to come and help and hang out this week, please see Archie or Donald, and we'll get you a place to serve. We want to try to knock that out before Easter. It is awesome. We've got some testimonies we're going to share. Probably won't do it today, we'll probably do it next week, of how God provided stuff that was just amazing. It was incredible. And I'm so fired up leading into Easter, singing all these songs with the big movie coming Friday night. Don't forget this. It's going to be awesome. Invite your friends to it. It speaks volumes about what God really did. And that's what we're looking at today, the empty tomb. And how do we really know it was empty? Because things like that don't happen every day, right? Raise anybody from the dead lately? <laughs> I haven't. I mean, I wish I did. I wish I had that kind of faith. Today we're going to explore probably... One of the most, if not the most important claim in all of Christianity. That's a big statement. To be able to say that, to open with that, the most important claim in all of Christianity. And that's this. He is not here. He is risen. That's what separates our faith from every other false faith on the planet. From every other demonic thing that's out there. From every other occultic thing. From every other shallow imitation that Lucifer tries to get us to, oh, don't believe in, in Yahweh. Oh, look over here, shiny things. All these distractions. This is where it all comes to this. He's not here. He is risen. Now to us, if you're a believer, that's a beautiful, soul-stirring statement. But to a skeptic, it seems a little crazy. A little out there, right? And they ask for proof. That's where your apologia comes into play. Knowing what to say, how to answer this. For a skeptic, and I get it, they want proof of this. And I understand, when something sounds too good to be true, it usually is. There's no such thing as a free meal. Yes, unless you come to Pop's hand, in which case, we do potlucks and they're free. When a skeptic comes, they want proof. And I get that, I understand that. You need to, to, to have some verifiable proof when something sounds too crazy to be true. Let me show you what I mean. Just this week, I found... I'm going to put up a picture, okay? This, when you recognize what this is, I just want you to shout it out if you recognize it. You with me? Okay? I'm going to put a picture up that's just to show you how crazy this is. Ready? Three, two, one. Here we go. Titanic. Titanic. Yes. About half of you got that. You know what's sad? If I put up this picture, the other half would have got that. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm the king of the world. We're talking about the Titanic. There are people, believe it or not, who dispute that this ship was real. There are people, believe it or not, and I'm going to show you, just so you know I'm not crazy, there were teenagers, and after seeing this movie, just recently saw it, and they took to Twitter to show their shock and their dismay to find out this wasn't just a movie, that there really was a ship named Titanic. And just so you can believe me, here are some actual tweets. Enjoy. Wait, so the Titanic actually happened? The Titanic was real? Hashtag what? Look at his eyes. I love it up there. He's so, just found out the Titanic was real, y'all. Guys, the Titanic was real. Hashtag mind blown. But my favorite, my favorite tweet of them all is this one right here. The skeptic to the end. I still don't know if the Titanic really happened. I just, call me skeptical. And we think, how can you not know history? Look at our Bibles, folks. How could people not know history? How could people not accept what you and I readily accept? What you and I not only accept, but we build our life on. We stake everything on this. A couple thousand years ago, something happened that had never happened before, kind of like that. And in this moment, there were people who said, I don't know. I'm still a little skeptical. I'm not really sure that the tomb was empty. You know, there are people who went to the tomb, and they were down and out and discouraged. They had just seen their leader crucified and ran through with a spear. And then a shining angel shows up and he utters these words right here that changed everything. He is not here. He is risen. This one single fact, this piece of good news right here should change everything. And again, as believers, we get this. We think that's cool. We get it. That's the good news. But skeptics, they want to know, is it true news? Or is this just more fake news? on the Communist News Network. Is this just one of those kind of things? Because we're just, what do we do? You know, how do you explain it? 
How do you come back? If someone were to come to you, your unchurched friends that I hope you're inviting, I hope you're praying for, and I hope you are excited about bringing them for Easter, if they turned to you and asked you this simple question, what would you say here? How would you? Good, good. Yes, it was. How do you know? What is your, what is your verifiable proof? What are the things beyond just, just your good feelings and your changed life? What would you say to them? So if you are here today and you need a fresh infusion of hope and you need reasons of why you can share your church, your unchurched friends of why this tomb is empty, you came to the right place on the right day. Here's why the resurrection and the empty tomb matters. I love how Paul says it. He says it point blank, very, very boldly, right up front. He says this, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is, what? Useless. And then he goes on to say, oh, and by the way, your faith is too. Can you, can you imagine the great Apostle Paul saying, look, it all comes down to this. This is the hinge of history. If this hasn't happened, if he's not been raised from the dead, everything we believe is a lie. Everything, it hinges on this. If his body's still there, call it off. Let's go get some bagels. Because this is the moment that changes everything. That the secular world would love to kind of sweep under the, let's just make it about Easter bunnies. <laughs> we'll dye them. They're cute little eggs and stuff, you know. Nothing wrong with that. By the way, we're going to have like 2,000 eggs here on Easter. Y'all come, okay? We're about 1,000 eggs short, so a little plug, bring a few more, and we're, we're going to have an awesome time. Michael Green wrote a book called Man Alive, and I love how he, he says this. He says, church, Christianity doesn't hold the resurrection to be one of many tenets of belief. It is the belief. All of our faith hangs on this moment. Without the resurrection, the church would never have begun, and the Jesus movement would have quickly fizzled. And then he goes on to end his quote this way. He says this, Christianity stands or falls with the truth of the resurrection. Once you disprove it, you have disposed of Christianity. That's why we need to know why we believe what we believe. Today is so powerful. Probably the most simple and straightforward passage on the resurrection is found in Luke 24. So go ahead and open your Bibles there today. Pull up your favorite Bible app, Luke 24. While you do that, let me welcome our online campus. And I want to set the context here of what we're going to be reading today. It's early Sunday morning. It's still very dark out. In fact, the sun hasn't come up. Jesus has been in the tomb now for two and a half, three days at this point. Sometime during the early night, women begin showing up, and they've arrived with spices to finish the burial process. Okay, they didn't quite finish it because the Sabbath was coming. They had to hurry and get Jesus off the cross. You remember the story. And when they arrive, the sun's not quite up. They are shocked to find that the stone has been rolled away. The seals are broken. The ropes are shattered. And they don't understand what's going until they're greeted by two shining angels in garments that are just dazzling them. And they look at them, and the angels ask them a great question. And it sets the table for what we're looking at. The question's this. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why are you, you're look, who are you looking for? You look for Jesus? He's not here. He's alive. And you're looking in a graveyard. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? It's a beautiful. And then they continue to say this, follow along with me. He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was with you in Galilee? The son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners. He was. Be crucified. He was. And on the third day, be raised again. And he was. Now, just so we can put it in a modern-day illustration of how foundational this truth is and how important it is that we grasp this today, I want to put it in modern-day terms. If I were to hire you to take down this building right here, a demolition expert, so to speak, if I were to call you in and ask you to come do this, most of you would probably know, if you're an expert, you don't have to worry about blasting the top floors. You don't have to attack the top floors. You don't even have to blow out the middle floors. All you have to do is weaken the foundation. That's all you have to do. And guess what? Gravity takes over. And once that, top, once that bottom is done, those tops start, that weight can't be supported. It starts to crumble and fall, and it starts looking like this right here. And you see that foundation explodes out. And once that happens, it is on like Donkey Kong playing ping pong in Hong Kong. It cannot be stopped. That tower is coming down. Did they blast the top parts? Didn't need to. Do people need to attack the, 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 the periphery of your faith? Don't need to. If they can just topple the resurrection, 
If they can just get you to question, is the tomb really empty? I mean, is he really the death eater? Can he really conquer the grave? If they can just get you to doubt that, then Satan has won a huge victory. And it all starts with weakening our, our apologia, our firm foundation. So the resurrection, the empty tomb are central to our faith. And we have to be able to explain it and then to defend it on a well-founded apologia. So before we start today, let me ask this, how are you doing with that? By the end of today, you will have some of the most incredible ways to refute and explain any question you have about the empty tomb. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore some of these common objections and these theories that are out there that, believe it or not, people are taking seriously. Some of these, to you, will seem laughable, and I get that. But we have to know how to explain them and defend them with a humility and a love and a graciousness. So we're going to look at it, and the first one that comes up all the time when you Google this, skeptics use this theory to explain away the empty tomb, and that is the stolen body theory. The stolen body theory. All right, so let's just go there. Some say Jesus couldn't possibly have raised from the dead. There's no way. That kind of stuff doesn't happen. We don't see that a lot. It's kind of unique, and that stuff doesn't happen. So if that's true and the body was stolen, we have a new problem. Now we have a genuine manhunt on our hands. And the question then becomes, who stole the body? If someone stole the body, who was it who did it? Let's see what the scriptures have to say to give us a point of reference. Okay, read with me in Matthew 28. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers, these are the soldiers guarding the tomb, a large sum of money telling them, here's what you're to say. His disciples came during the night and stole the body away while you were asleep. And if this report gets to the governor, don't worry, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money, and they did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So with this theory, we have three possibilities as to who really could have stolen the body. The first one is the obvious one, and that's the Roman government. Was it the Roman government? The other one is the Jewish authorities. All right, so let's look at these two first. In both of these scenarios, these two groups have absolutely no motive. I'm talking zero. They would have loved to have produced a body. It would have made their day. Think about this. If they could have produced a body, they would have in a heartbeat. Here's why. Because producing a body and saying, here's your Messiah, would have crushed this growing movement of fanatics called people of the way, people who follow this Christ. If they could have produced a body, man, they desperately wanted to produce a body. They could have put this out of existence. It would have saved the Romans so much time, so much money, so much effort and manpower and having to pursue and stamp out all these Christians that are trying to persecute to this, this wildfire spreading faith that we would just want to be done with. It's, it's annoying us. Can we please stamp this out? If either of these two groups would have stolen the body, I promise, the very first thing they would have done was to show it to the world. They would have said, here he is. Hold him up. Just hold him up. Just look. Here's your Messiah. He didn't raise from the dead. You all are loony. Here's your Messiah. He's dead. He didn't raise from the dead. Your faith is in vain. Now go home. <laughs> There's nothing to see here. Move along. If they could have, they would have. But that didn't happen. So if it wasn't the Romans and it wasn't the Jews, the third possibility that the skeptics say is his disciples stole it. What do you say if they come up and they say, hey, tell me why the disciples didn't do it? Here's how we know. When you consider the disciples doing it, this makes even less sense. Think about this. The life that the disciples were about to lead was going to be awful. From a human standpoint, they were going to be living from this day forward as broke, homeless, hunted, and chased evangelists. From this day forward, it was changed life. They crucified their leader, and they knew they were going to be on the run the rest of their lives, being chased, whipped, beaten, thrown in jail, and eventually put to death. Every single one of these disciples was in a position to know if Jesus rose from the dead or not. They were in that close proximity. You guys, we know each other. You would know if I died or not. You would know it. There would be no hiding it. Imagine how much more every one of these would be put to death for believing this. Six of them would follow Jesus and be crucified and scourged and beaten beyond recognition. Think about that. Why would any of them endure persecution to the point of death rather than simply just recant? It would have been so much more convenient for them. They could have said, you know what? I thought he was the son of God, but he wasn't. And we see his body. We took it. Can, can I just go back to fishing, please? 
Can I just go be a tax collector again? My life was so much easier, but they didn't. It would have been so much easier for them to do it. So you say, well, they died for their faith. But pastor, don't a lot of people die for their faith? Yeah. And here's the difference. People will die for their faith if they know it to be true. People will die for their faith if they believe everything they're doing is not a lie. But no one will die for a lie. No one will willingly go and live this life and die, especially if they know it's a life. And in their mind, they know it's a lie and they've stolen the body and they've hidden it. No one will do that. No one knowingly does that. And the disciples were so certain of the empty tomb and the resurrection that they staked their lives on it. And they gave their lives for it. And that's powerful stuff. There's another theory going around. This is what critics often point to, to say that he merely fainted. This is my favorite. This is called the swoon theory. All right? Now, if you were here Easter 22 years ago, I touched on this just a little bit, okay? If you're not familiar, a quick recap of this. The swoon theory is, is the theory that came up about 1800, 1810, something like that, and it began to gain popularity among secular humanists, trying to dispel our faith. And they came out and they say, Christ never really died. What, what happened, the, the reason he was able to come out of the tomb was because he was never really dead to begin with. The theory says this, the shock that Jesus went through from loss of blood on the cross, from his wounds, from the spear, from all that he suffered, sent him into a semi-coma, not death. Sent him into a semi-coma. And when they took him off the cross and they removed the nails and they, they wrapped him up and they put him into the tomb, the aroma of the spices he was wrapped in and the coolness of the tomb somehow woke him up. That's, that's the theory, okay? So this theory states that when he came out of the grave, the disciples saw him and simply assumed he looked good to me, he's resurrected, all right? So let's walk through this together, and I want you to count the staggering amount of improbable for this theory to be believable. If the theory is true, you ready? Walk with me here then that means Jesus successfully survived the beating, the scourging, the flogging, okay, the public humiliation. This is all coming from a trained soldier who was a weapons expert, who was designed to inflict maximum damage and torture into a person to bring them to death's door just so the cross could finish them off. That's what this guy was done. He would need to have survived all that, survive his massive loss of blood, then survive a full crucifixion, including asphyxiation, because when you're hung in this position, you can't breathe, and you have to raise up on those nails just to gasp for another breath, and then you're down in excruciating agony. He has to survive all of that, plus dehydration, then further loss of blood. Then, don't forget this, he would need to survive this spear thrust through his side that punctured the lung and the pericardium, and, and the blood and, wa and water flowed out. He would have to survive that, all the additional blood loss that would pour out of his now additional gaping wound, which incidentally would go completely untreated. Remember this. Then he would survive being taken off the cross, the nails being removed, further blood loss, entombed in a cold, dark, possibly damp tomb, mummified, wrapped in 75 pounds of spices and cloths between the layers. Then survive for three additional days in that environment with no food and even worse, no water. Go through that, then somehow wake himself up from a semi-coma state with no medical assistance, having lost now most of his blood over the last three days, several untreated open wounds, then somehow, think about this, stand up in his mummy-like grave clothes, which by now have hardened around him like plaster, then somehow hobble over to the stone which weighed between two to 4,000 pounds, and somehow roll the stone away, then overpower between four and 20 trained Roman soldiers who are not supposed to let this guy out, overpower them, then, wait for it, walk seven miles wrapped up on crucified feet that have been pierced to Emmaus so he could be seen, and then appear to disciples and pull off a miracle of miracles, convince them he's perfectly fine and he's resurrected. Call me a skeptic if I don't have enough faith to believe that's what happened. 
That is so incredibly un- unbelievable to me. It's easier to believe the miracle of the resurrection than to believe all of this happened. But until somebody told me this and I researched and I learned this, I wouldn't be able to share that with a lost friend. They'd look at me and go, well, how do you know, how do you know we didn't just have a, a death-like sleep and, and wake himself up? <laughs> now I know. Now I can look at him and not be, I can have a reason to, to tell him. There's no way he showed up and he says, hey, guys, look, look how good I look. <laughs> I'm perfectly fine. I'm resurrected. Who's with me? You want a body like this? There's no way. There's no way he was fine. He didn't look fine. He didn't sound fine. It was obvious that he hasn't been just in a... Jesus didn't just take a power nap. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't fine. Y'all know that friend you have where you can take one look at them and you know they're not fine, but they try to convince you they are. Whether they, they got the flu or something's gone wrong. You're like, man, are you okay? I'm worried about you. Like, I'm fine. I'm fine. And you know they're lying because their voice goes way high, like this right here. I always think of Ross, like in that squeaky voice. I'm fine. I'm fine. No, you're not fine. He was savagely beaten. He was tortured. He went through all of this out of love for me and you. How anyone can seriously believe this swoon theory, this this fainting theory is beyond me. It is probably of the four we look at today, it is the flimsiest. It is the one that makes as much sense as this picture here of a sloth in an astronaut outfit. It makes no sense. Just looking at it is confusing to me. Yet this is just as believable as what we've gone through. It's so unbiblical and it's not supported by, by science at all. Now, let's look at the next theory and maybe it will be slightly more plausible. Objection number three that you might hear is the hallucination theory. Mm. This one's probably my favorite because I love how you can refute this and have your apologia. Here's how the theory goes. The skeptics suggest that it was something like a mass hallucination, okay? A mass hallucination where People had such an anticipation of the resurrection, they were so excited about Jesus coming back from the dead, that they actually projected their own hallucinations onto Jesus because they thought they saw Jesus because they wanted to see Jesus. Does that make sense? Almost like you talked yourself into it, and it was a hallucination, all right? This is a true theory, all right? I know we can scoff at it, but I promise you, somebody may say this, and we need to have the answers to be able to lovingly be able to share this. Here's the problem with that. The first one is the most obvious. Hallucinations are not group events. <laughs> it just, unless you're at a Grateful Dead concert. But hallucinations, they, they <laughs> oh, some of you were at a Grateful Dead concert, I can tell. Think about this. If you're not sure what a mass hallucination is, this would be like me coming before you this morning and saying, hey, guys, y'all remember that awesome dream we had last night? Y'all remember that? Wasn't that crazy? Wasn't, wasn't that an awesome dream? And y'all be looking at me like, what are you talking about? I didn't have your dream. I know you didn't have my dream because my dream always involves the Incredible Hulk and I'm only armed with little pickles I can throw at him. That's my dream. And if any of you had that dream last night, come see me. We will have prayer, okay? There's no way we had the same dream. There's, it's, it's, it would be like me doing this kind of like, like a, a Jedi mind trick where Obi-Wan comes up and he says, no, nothing to see here. Move along. Just, 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 just please, these aren't the droids you're looking for. We don't have Jedi powers, and we are not doing a mass hallucination. To think otherwise is, if you were to ask a psychiatrist how 500 people, and that's how many saw him in this initial moment, 500 different people having the exact same hallucination at the exact same time on the same day would be a historic first, to say the least. It would be a scientific miracle. In fact, it would be a miracle almost on the scale of a resurrection. So why not just believe this miracle? It doesn't make scientific sense when you look at this. The resurrection, the, the, here's, here's the next point of why a hallucination theory falls apart. They were not expecting the resurrection. We miss this because we are. We look back 2,000 years and we go, the resurrection, this is it. This is the hinge point of humanity. They weren't. Remember, I mean, let's be honest. The Christ followers, when we find them right after, they were crushed. They were perplexed and disillusioned and discouraged and depressed. Their leader, the one they thought was going to overthrow the Roman oppression, was lost. He was crucified right before their eyes. And it was obvious they weren't really expecting an actual physical resurrection because they weren't looking for it. Where were they? When we find them next, they are huddled in a darkened room with the door locked, running for their lives, fearful. They were hiding for that. 
Luke 24, 1 says something very interesting. See if you can pick it out without me telling you. Very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Did you catch it? If you didn't, don't feel bad. I didn't either the first time. Here's your weekly truth grenade. You don't go to a tomb with burial spices to anoint someone who is alive. They were not truly expecting him to be alive. They were going to finish up the burial process that they ran out of time before the Sabbath. They were going to do that, just hoping they could get into the tomb. And here's another hidden gem. According to the church historians, Thomas, one of the disciples, we always call him Doubting Thomas, Thomas was put to death all the way over in India years later. This doubting Thomas, the person least expecting the real resurrection, let's not forget how he earned his name. Remember what he said? I will not believe it, even though the disciples told me, he says, I won't believe it unless I what? Unless I could touch his scars and put my hand in his side. And Jesus says, come on over, do it. Thomas, the one who doubted the least, even when his brothers and his disciples said, he's risen from the dead, Thomas. I won't believe it. This guy was not about to go to his death saying, eh. In all honesty, it was probably a hallucination. <laughs> I'm over here in India spreading the gospel, doing what I can, and I know you're about to inflict the worst torture death I can imagine, but it's probably a hallucination, but that's good enough for me. <laughs> Not a chance. And if the people who knew Jesus the best felt that strongly about it, how much more so can we? You see how this builds our faith? You see how this shows us just the incredible stuff? But there's another reason that this couldn't have been a hallucination, and that's because Jesus appeared to believers and non-believers. And this is where the whole thing falls apart. This is one of the coolest parts. When he's speaking to a crowd, right after Jesus ascended, Peter boldly proclaimed this. Read this with me. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Did you catch that? Did you see something very strange in this passage? Notice the crowd's reaction. This is so good. You're going to love this. Notice what the crowd didn't do. Did any one of them respond with an angry fist? And Ray said, Peter, what are you talking about? We don't know any of these miracles. We, you're crazy. We don't know anything you're talking about. You are out of your mind and you're making stuff up. We don't know about miracles or any wonders or anything. He, they didn't say that at all. In fact, there was not a word of denial that was uttered. And they could have. In fact, if you read on what's very revealing, history says that 3,000 of those people that day agreed with Peter and believed in Christ. It was the first revival in history. 3,000 people. Think about that. This is huge evidence for your apologia. Lock this one in. They knew Peter was speaking the truth, or they would have shut him down right then and there. They would have said, Peter, you're out of your mind. Not one of us saw anything you're talking about. You're a fanatic. You don't know what you're talking about. Go away. And they would have dismissed him. But that didn't happen. You know why? Because the crowd knew the reality of Jesus. They knew the resurrection. They were eyewitnesses of it. There were miracles everywhere. And if you weren't the one who witnessed a miracle, your neighbor did. One out of every two people. Think about that. They saw that. They saw his death. They knew the reality of his resurrection. These things had taken place right in front of them. And this is the part I love when I look at this passage of Scripture. Not one person in the crowd even tried to correct Peter. Not one. No one even raised their hand and said, mm, excuse me, sir, I don't know what you're talking about. No one said anything. So let's look at the last theory floating around before I run out of time. Objection number four, the wrong tomb theory. Mm -mm -mm. This is great. This is, this is good. The theory says this. What if, big what if, what if the disciples simply went to the wrong tomb? Right? As, as, as the theory goes, they were exhausted. They were emotionally drained. They were jaded by this time. They were down and out. The disciples go. It's early. It's kind of dark. They go to a tomb that kind of looks maybe like Jesus' tomb. They look in. They see that it's empty. They jump for joy. They high-five, and they go off on their way, and the rest is history. There's just, there's just one problem with that. 
This was not a little execution. This wasn't just something that happened over, oh, hey, did you hear about that? I didn't know they were doing that this week. Is that this week? This was a huge deal. Three people were being crucified, and it was, it was a, a town event. There were so many people at this. This was a capital punishment. Crowds came out to check it out. In fact, if this does, check this out. We can tell you today, 2,000 years later, the name of the tomb that he was laid in. It was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. We even know the name. This was a leading citizen. This was a famous, wealthy guy, well-known. He certainly would have come up to the guys and pointed out, hey, hey guys, uh, wrong tomb. It's this one. What are you doing? Come here. Bring him over. They didn't. Every one of them was in a situation. They could know that. And here's the second part. If this was the wrong tomb, well, that means there was a right tomb. Do you ever think about that? If this was the wrong, there's a right tomb. You know what that means? That means there's a body. There's a body somewhere. If he didn't rise from the dead, there is a body somewhere. And that means the Roman authorities or the Jewish leaders could have easily produced that body to stamp out this growing Christian movement. They would have loved to do that. So what do we do with this information? How do we share this? What, what do we do with this life-changing knowledge? Because let's be honest, it is so easy for us to sit on this knowledge. We pass by the coworker who needs to hear about this. We're driving through the, the drive-thru. We hand our Big Mac and we see the ladies in tears. I'm like, can I help you? It's so easy to sit on the hope we have. It's so easy to keep it to it because we, we got it. <laughs> We're in. I mean, isn't that good enough, Pastor? What about the skeptics? Man, that's on them. They'll, they'll answer for that. Here's the deal. Once upon a time, somebody didn't give up trying to reach you. And we can't give up trying to reach them. But for the grace of God, there go us. That could be us. Somebody who just said, you know what? It's a little inconvenient for me to do that. Someone didn't give up trying to reach out to you. That's why we always want to make room for one more at the cross. Always have one more seat at the table. One beggar telling another beggar where we found food. That's why we do what we do. That's why we put out extra chairs every week so guests can come in and they could sit together, try to leave groupings of four or five chairs together so they could sit together as a family. That's why we put out signs and, and flags. And I'm so thankful for our volunteers. They do this week in and week out. I hope you see them when you come. I love it when people have joined our church and I say, tell me how in the world did you find us? You know, you know what they say? The last two families who have joined our church said, I saw your sign, and I Googled your website. Then another family said, I saw your sign. I didn't have time to read what the website said, but I followed your arrows like a treasure hunt, <laughs> and I found you. Those families are still here today because of those faithful people, those people who go out in the heat and hammer in spikes drenched with sweat or dodging sleep bullets coming down from the sky because it changes every 10 minutes in North Carolina. And it's just... It's, it, it, the forgotten people. That's why we do some of these things. That's why people come and give a Saturday and work their tails off to increase our space for kids when they show up. Thank you, guys. You're awesome. You are faithful volunteers. But when we say we've reached enough people for Christ, we missed the Great Commission. When we say, God, hey, it's good. Bless us 204. No more. Close the door. <laughs> We're good. When we lose that vision, that purpose, we miss the whole reason he came to save and seek that which was lost. So here's my challenge, because you know I'm going somewhere with this. My challenge is found in this graphic right here. Eight out of ten people who don't normally attend church will go to church with you on Easter. Someone just invites them. Eight out of ten. Y'all, this stat would be worth it if it was one out of ten. So here's my challenge. Will you pray for God to put someone in your path, a neighbor, a coworker, a classmate, somebody, family member, and bring them. I am already preparing the gospel message for two weeks. You don't even have to wait till Easter. If you want to bring them next week, Palm Sunday, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be, going to be really, really powerful stuff. God is just pouring it out, and I am so excited. It is never too late to invite somebody. This information, this truth we hold is so good. We can't sit on it. We can't keep this a secret. And I hope that this series that we finished today, this apologetics, gives you more fuel for your faith. 
more, more ammunition to share the truth in love. Let's do this. Pray with me. God, I thank you. You're already putting people on people's hearts right now at this moment. I pray for a divine appointment. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray you would highlight somebody in our mind and you would do more than that. You would even ordain the steps so that our paths cross, that we couldn't miss it, that even if we were distracted or looking down on our phones or just in the middle of something, Lord, that it would just highlight in the spiritual realm and we would know this is the person that we need to share the truth with. God, thank you for your challenge. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the power of the empty tomb. You are so good to give us a chance to know you as Savior. Lord, I pray you would give us that opportunity to share that with another. Just as somebody took the time to share it with us. God, I thank you for this person that's on our heart. I pray that again that you would soften their hearts even now you're working behind the scenes. Holy Spirit, till that ground that only you can. And we'll give you the credit. You get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.